So welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to our uh, Sustainability 2.0 webinar. Uh, we are still waiting for a minute or two for other attendees to join. Uh, please be reminded that um, your mics are muted for now and um, if you have any questions feel free to use a questions tab and um, write your questions down. We'll have enough time in the end of the presentation to go through them and if we miss your question we'll answer um, in an email. Um, so so um, let's begin um, our webinar. So Henrik and I, um, we had this idea to, um, to talk about embodied and operational carbon. Um, as we saw that um, there's lots of interest and I would say even um, kind of a shift uh, towards embodied carbon last year. So um, this is um, certainly a great trend and uh, we definitely welcome looking at uh, carbon beyond operational carbon and also knowing that um, we in construction industry have been pretty good with tackling operational carbon so far. So it's time to look at materials as well. Um, but so we also thought that it would be good to talk a bit about it in a bit more details and um, also using um, uh, it all software, uh, our LCA software to show on real examples what it actually means if um, uh, if projects um, uh, have different targets both for operational and embodied impacts um, and um, what happens if um, these targets are sometimes even competing with each other. So it's important to mention that this uh, webinar is um, not only about carbon, it's really more about uh, low carbon design um, as the whole and um, also when projects uh, have quite a restrained budget. So um, I'll start with a bit of um, information where it all started and why and, um, and then I'll let um, Henrik here jump into the software and show you a few examples and what it means to the projects. So um, let's look at the industry trends. Um, as you know, COVID last year really tried to distract us from the climate uh, emergency, but um, the discussions that were started by the global communities also um, advanced and uh, resulted into many declarations um, and commitments, both on the governmental level and um, by uh, whole companies. So we could see um, many different standards and frameworks, um, guidelines that embrace uh, ESGs, even new tools appearing on the market. And this is all great to see. Um, however, I think it's really important to keep um, everything in balance, um, environmental, social and economical realities of this uh, topic. So as you know already, um, in 2016 uh, World Green Building Council uh, started a global project, Advancing Net Zero Project, um, which aims to promote net zero carbon buildings, uh, which is basically an attempt to reduce uh, the emissions from fossil fuels. Um, so originally the definition of net zero carbon buildings was a building that is um, highly energy efficient and also 100% powered by renewables. So it really looks at operational carbon. So obviously there is a bit of uh, refining since um, um, there is a required since uh, embodied impacts were not addressed properly in this definition and uh, in 2019 World Green Building Council have issued uh, a new report called bringing uh, embodied carbon up front. So now we have two targets here uh, as a global community 100% uh, net zero emissions buildings by 2050 and on top of that 40% less embodied carbon emissions by uh, 2030. So what is embodied uh, and what is operational carbon? Um, well, first guess would be just put all materials as embodied carbon and then all appliances that use energy into operational category. But this is not quite right. Um, if you think um, an HVAC system or a PV module uh, would also consist of some materials, so you just need to produce them, manufacture, transport to the side, install and so on. So it also has some embodied component in there. And um, so a solar module might um, help you to reduce your operational carbon, but it would also increase embodied carbon of the building, right? So 
similar with the insulation material. So um, shall we not use all these products at all, just to for the sake of not of reducing embodied carbon, or maybe there will be some trade-offs uh, effect on the operational carbon here as well. So. Um, you probably saw this slide, um, and currently the split between embodied and operational is 30-70. Um, this portion uh, varies a lot depending on, on the state you are in and the country you are in. Even uh, in Australia, it can be very different. Um, this split can be 20-80 or even 50-50 in some particular cases. So in countries like New Zealand or in Scandinavian countries where the grid is already decarbonized and um, consists of 70% from renewables, uh, this split will be completely different. It may already be in, uh, like this. And, and this is a progression um, by the architecture uh, 2030 that um, says that uh, the split will, um, uh, will, will, um, will look like this in the future. Um, and um, as you know, um, also grids around the world will be decarbonizing and um, uh, in the next 20, 30 years, uh, this probably will happen automatically. Um, in terms of environmental assessment and LCA, um, so LCA is usually form an important part of um, international uh, rating schemes and um, in Australia most common ones are, um, as you know, Green Star, LEED and um, um, Living Building Challenge for buildings and ISCA for infrastructure. In Europe, most common ones are BREAM and DGNB for buildings and SQL for infrastructure. But um, there is one, one thing in common here, so that life cycle assessment is part of materials credit category. And sometimes in, in some rating schemes, it's uh, limited to a scope of assessment of materials only and um, not also emissions caused by energy use. However, some uh, rating schemes um, require the assessment to be as holistic as possible and forms part of every single project, like in case of German Sustainability Council, DGNB. They also require life cycle cost analysis so that environmental goals do not explode your budgetary limits. Um, and um, so there is a bit of confusion and misconception around LCA and um, materials assessment, and it's often seen as a synonym. However, it's not quite right. So LCA uh, in its original definition includes also um, other life cycle stages and impacts caused by everything, materials, energy, and water use over the life uh, span of the, of the project. So just not to uh, provide you a bit of clarity for uh, what is actually uh, embodied carbon and what is operational carbon, I uh, quite like to use this slide, you, you probably know already, but just to refresh it as um, there are many different definitions that um, circulate at the moment. Um, so from the LCA perspective, upfront carbon um, is uh, in the module A, so basically materials that um, are used during um, uh, the um, before the building starts operating, uh, their installation, transport, um, and then B stages um, where you operate the building. You look at also energy use and water use. So operational carbon is really B6 module, um, and uh, C module is end of life, so demolition and uh, disposal. And um, so you see that embodied carbon is really um, the rest. So it's um, modules A, um, B, and C uh, minus B6 and uh, minus B7 in this case. So um, it's kind of just to give you a bit of um, refreshing <laughs> information. And um, I'll pass um, next to, uh, to Henrique to show on uh, real examples um, how it all works and um, hope you you can write down your questions while we go. Um, I'll, I'll pass it on to you, Enrique. Thanks, Maria. I'll just bring up my screen here in a moment. Yeah, you can see it. Cool. So as Maria has pointed, um, this presentation is focused on low low carbon design. We know there's there's much more than that than than uh, than low carbon design on on general good design. So it's purely an environmental variable 
as part of your design process. So that's why we're narrowing the the information to to focus on environmental performance, especially carbon. Uh, we have seen a lot of the yeah the segregated targets between operational and embodied and it's good it's good that we all we're, we're increasing the targets and we we're achieving higher um, savings but sometimes it, there's negative negative trade-offs with that process so setting caps on embodied and operational carbon separately will often lead to poor allocation of available capital unnecessary expense and design dis disruption to achieve similar reduction and you could end up penalizing net zero or very low carbon buildings that are aggressively pursuing low life cycle carbon strategies so if you're trying to, to add renewables or if you're trying to, to improve your building fabric that will end up um, increasing your your embodied impacts but there's a very quick payback in environmental terms that with your, your energy savings so it's important to to look at everything um, together as a as a, as a whole life uh, whole project approach and the way we do that in in the software is using the uh, etool lcd scenarios so this is a quite a, a recent feature um, not not many of our users have been exposed to this yet but it's quite nice because you can focus on the design instead of footprinting so you easily analyze the model for improvements the model improvements and you create this audit trail so you have the track audit trail of what's been changed you can automatically produce reports and provide that as a feedback to design teams and you can run different scenarios run sensitive analysis that test different scenarios and early on so the, the idea is to use this as a design tool again as a, as a whole uh, project instead of separating into life cycle stages or embodied versus operational or segregating categories like materials energy and water the idea is to look at everything together in one model and see how it all interacts so prepared a um, quick example here in the software just to show you um, like a base baseline model in the software so this is a typical office building over a 60 year lifespan um, this one in particular is uh, in the uk so we're talking about 10,400 tons of carbon over the life of the building for the baseline and we put forward strategies for the design team on an improved design and lower the um, the emissions to 3,800 uh, tons so significant savings and when we look at the scenarios um, option for this this project you can see there's, um, there's a list of different strategies. So this is the report that comes out of that um, scenarios tab into the automated report. And the way we model the strategies, so again, this is looking at the whole project. We try to reduce all embodied impacts first. So we're looking at alternative construction methods, CLT slabs in, in place of metal decks, timber structure, different paving uh, options, um, trying to reduce the clinker content, so cement replacement options. So there's a, a few embodied reduction strategies. And once we've modeled those, we then go into energy efficiency, as well as uh, water efficiency and renewables. So the list is very comprehensive and it targets the whole all different areas of the project. So with this with this in mind, um, we can take some some examples out of this. Um, and I've and I put a note here just to to give you a bit more clarity on on how this helps um, prioritize 
these strategies and ensure the best bang for buck, really. So the idea is we look at the environmental performance or the environmental savings of different strategies, see how they rank, which one is the most relevant, where the hotspot hotspots are and then we we also look at the cost we um we don't do a very detailed cost analysis sometimes we do when we're doing life cycle costing as part of the the services scope we also offer that but we often focused on the environmental variable and we put that forward for the design team and they engage with their consultants their suppliers to break down the cost and and come up with the the amount of carbon you're able to save with every dollar spent. So you can prioritize those strategies using that approach. So one example here is you could end up with an uh, imported reduction target. For example, here, this the Yorkstone place uh, in place of concrete pavers in the pedestrian areas. So there was, there was the hard landscaping area here was quite significant. So there was almost a 3% saving in, in carbon. And this is compared to the similar range of the low GWP impact for the refrigerant gas from the HVAC system. So if the paving option costs a lot less and achieves higher carbon savings, then it makes more sense for you to target that first. So if, if you didn't have all these in the same place, it would be very hard to, to create that tangibility, to be able to compare different areas of the design. Um, another example is the comparison of the timber structure. Timber structure with, um, let's say for example, the, the BMS, the building energy management system. They also have similar 4% 4, 4 range, 4.7% range of, of carbon savings. So one is there's, there's, there's a big disruption in the, in the design process. The other one is more the automation. So depending on the, on the cost again, you can look at this and think, okay, they have similar impact reduction um savings and then you can look at the cost to make a, a an informed decision so it really gives you that clarity on how different strategies um, compare the other interesting thing about this list is that um, we can see that the energy efficiency um, strategies they're very significant so heat pump in place of gas or heating LED lighting and also lighting controls, they're all very significant, as well as solar PVs. So when we talked about the, the allocation of capital, where you invest your money to ensure the best return on both capital and the environment. In this case, we could pursue the operational savings first, because there's the most significant and go really hard on them before we try to achieve embodied impact reduction. So if you have an embodied impact target, it could prevent you from targeting the lower, the low hanging fruits in the operational stages. So really important, we, yeah, we look at everything together instead of segregating the the targets between different life cycle phases. Uh, just go back to the presentation here. So potential risks, as I discussed with the, the embodied impact reduction only, it would lead to misconceptions in the in the construction sector. So we hear a lot about um, LCA being associated to materials that creates confusion uh, or, or where the, 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 the most significant savings will come from. Um, it would mean a lot of very cost effective carbon reduction strategies would be foregone. As I was saying, the, the, op the operational savings, you know, if we, we, we're targeting embodied impact 
focusing on embedded impact, you could leave some low hanging fruits strategies related to operational and also uh, operational impacts can be significant can it can be significant over time if poor products have been selected so if you try to chase a lower lower impact in, in the building envelope for example you can you can end up with a lot more impact on your operational carbon so if you have that that imported carbon uh, cap it could prevent you from from exceeding or yeah, increasing the performance in all the areas of the business or the building. So one example is the ultra efficient building fabric, as I as I mentioned, um, strategies um, such as double glazing or even triple glazing, air tightness, uh, naturally ventilated buildings will all, will always increase embodied carbon. In some cases, the, the, the dual facade systems that re, the, uh, required for for naturally ventilated uh, buildings, it will have a payback in one to three years. Even in even in in low carbon grids, so consideration of ultra efficient fabric strategies would be far less favorable for design teams required to meet an embodied only target. So if you're setting specific embodied reduction targets, it could prevent you from, from achieving those, those benefits uh, from, from ultra efficient building fabrics. And it's also works the, the other way around as well. If you're setting operational targets only, it will lead to misconceptions in the, in the construction sector about what a low carbon building is and where the opportunities for carbon reductions are. We have seen a lot of net zero carbon buildings in terms of operational carbon, but there is still very high impact, very um, a lot of upfront emissions, a lot of maintenance, which is not uh, clearly communicated. Um, same thing, you would mean a lot of very cost effect carbon reduction strategies would be foregone. So if you keep chasing your net zero operational carbon to be 100% neutral, um, you could end up spending a lot more money to achieve the, the remaining 30-20%, the, the hardest bits to, to, to achieve. You could be spending that money in other areas, reducing, you know, improving your, your concrete uh, mix or changing your construction methods with the same amount of money. Um, so upfront impacts can be significant can be significant in regions with low carbon grids, and they represent better environmental gain for the same capital invested when compared to strategies required to achieve net zero carbon, for example. Um, so I think I yeah I try to model this here just to show you what it means if you go to a base design um, commercial building here and this is a typical office building in here in Australia this is this we set set this example in Australia where we combine the different credits. So the idea is here that we're looking at uh, multiple credits in one model to see how everything interacts. And we know that energy is a dominating um, impact. And we, we see the proportion, majority of the impact, almost 80 or 90% of this example here is dominated by energy. So yes, it makes a lot more sense to start focusing on um, operational savings. But you can also change the lifespan. So if we, we, we have a limited time to tackle or to mitigate the climate crisis, we talk about 2030 and then 2050. This building is set at a uh, 60 year lifespan. So we can change this to, I don't know, 20 years. 
just to, to give you an, an, uh, an idea. So it changed a bit, a fair bit. We see that now the operational energy still dominates the impact, but now the product is starting to become more, more and more relevant as we shorten the analysis. So you can also run this um, sensitivity analysis on, on lifespan. And if you, yeah, if you make it 10 years to meet your 2030 um, or 2031, um, reduction targets and then yeah of course the the, the energy is going to drop because that's an annual incremental impact whereas the the products they mainly the upfront emissions so let me go back I'll make a different change here now I'm just going to locate this project in a different grid so change the location to the UK so I'm going here change the site attributes and move this from the New South Wales, uh, Wales grid to the UK. And just refresh this. And you see, yeah, even in a 60-year lifespan, it's similar. It's it's similar to what Australia was in a 20-year lifespan. So the energy is still significant, but the products are also relevant. If we shorten, do we do the same thing and we shorten this to 20 years? Now they're very, yeah, they're very close together in terms of um, the relevance of the impact. Um, if you drop it to 10 years, then it's good, the material is gonna become more, more um, relevant. So it really depends on, on the location. It depends on, on the timing, of what type of emissions you try to, to, to reduce. So it's important that you look at everything together instead of trying to separate, again, by cycle stages or um, energy, water, material, just to see how everything interacts and where you should be um, focusing on and spending your, your, your capital first. Back to the presentation here. This is, this links with the the position statement with that we wrote. It's it's over a year old now but it's still relevant. I, I was searching for new content for this presentation. I came across this, uh, Rich, um, Richard Haynes, he wrote this as a feedback to, to the NCC update, targeting a higher start rating for residential buildings. And this is something we, we always talk about, is trying to look at uh, the, the house the whole impact the whole life cycle impact of a house and understanding what a thermal performance improvement represents so this, there's a result here that's um, moving a house from six to seven stars that usually delivers uh, a 25 percent savings in heating cooling so a significant savings in heating cooling it only represents on average a two percent reduction in life cycle impact so not a, a huge reduction overall. So this, uh, yeah, this charts here, pie charts, the different capitals in Australia, and we can see the more most the more extreme climates here: Canberra, Dar Darwin, Hobart. They have the 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 dark blue, which is the the remaining impacts related to thermal performance, and the the green is the, the amount you save from going to six to seven stars. But what is interesting is that you have all this, uh, the light blue, which is the, all the life cycle impacts. So it goes back to that, um, where, you know, where, where could be, can we get better bank for a buck elsewhere? 
That's the question we always ask ourselves when conducting life cycle design. And in this case, with um, the improvement in thermal performance, it's usually driven by uh, thermal mass. So you have to either use uh, brick or concrete, for example, to get your, your buildings to, to rate from six to seven stars, and that could lead to a negative trade-off. So you get environmental savings in thermal performance, in your energy use, but you end up adding more impacts to your to, to associated with your materials. So when we ask ourselves, can we get a better return elsewhere? Then we look at this. Um, we broke down the other impacts, which is the light blue portion of this analysis into the most significant items. And we can equally target uh, materials, which is not covered by the NCC, neither the energy plug loads, so your appliances and your, your indirect uh, energy use. Um, so this, this is interesting because it, it highlights the, you know, you can keep pushing your, your building envelope to go to seven stars, eight stars, or even 10 stars. But the, you're going to get diminishing benefits for, for money invested. So there's better other areas of your design that you could be spending the same amount of money and achieving a better environmental reduction. So this, I thought this was quite relevant for this discussion as well. Um, let me go back here. Then we go on to renewables. Uh, we had a, a one specific project, which was the Perth Stadium, that they had. It was it was a government project, and they it was very innovative to include a carbon reduction target in a government um, tender. So it was, it was a tender requirement, but they they end up breaking breaking the target into operational, embodied, and then an overall target. So. The strategy that we put forward was one of the most significant savings was coming from PV, but it was significantly increasing the embodied impact. So we had to then demonstrate the overall life cycle savings was a net benefit, although we had an increase in, in embodied impact. So solar PV systems are very low cost of uh, low cost method of reducing life cycle carbon, even in low carbon grids. Distributed renewables is, is very important for grid decarbonization. And also there's the, the replacement, not only the initial installation, but the replacement of uh, solar PV system throughout the life of the building can be very significant. Um, so they will be far less favorable for design teams that they have specific imported reduction targets to, to achieve. Uh, in Perth, we know we have a relatively high carbon grid. The climate is is very mild, and uh, inherent heating cooling loads are quite low. And we have abundant solar energy resources, so these things tend to favor the installation of PV as a reduction strategy. When you go to Europe, in UK, for example, um, relatively low carbon grid, the climate is colder, um, so you have more demand for heating and the solar, solar energy resources are significantly lower so a PV is not as effective compared to Perth. Still good strategy but not as effective so other strategies like timber or passive design strategies could also uh, present a better net impact reduction. So this is this is very important to um, emphasize is that life cycle assessment it doesn't favor a particular technology or a construction method it it accounts for these various factors and provides the users with feedback on the relative performance gains for each considered strategy. So one thing that works in Europe is going to be different elsewhere in the world in in Australia or in in, in the U.S. It really depends on the location, it depends on the project uh, 
and depends on the application. So you really have to model everything together to understand the best, uh, the best strategies. And there's also the future grid scenarios, which is something that we, we have introduced in the software um, recently. Uh, government, uh, this was motivated initially by the HS2, uh, the high the high speed train project we're working on uh, in the UK. And they um, asked us to to look at that for them and add new grids. So when you go into the the library here in the software, uh, the templates we have the templates, the EPDs, different benchmarks. But you notice that we also have the grids. So this probably won't be displayed by the for the users. This is this just for the admin users that you can create new grids and and play with that but it soon be available for the users to to create or or, or test different different grids as well so create a very basic example here to demonstrate this um, but the idea is to to forecast the carbonization of the grid and see what changes it makes to the decisions that we are yeah we making today um, so what i've done here go using that same baseline model let me just revert this back to um what was that yeah to australia Okay. Let's refresh this one. So right now I went to, I think I also changed the design life 20 years. So I'm gonna go back to 60 years. There we go. So pretty obvious um, strategy there to reduce energy, uh, introducing renewables. Uh, so I added a uh, 100 kilowatt PV system to the model to see what it does. So initially we are looking at 5.6 tons. So this is measured in kilograms of carbon per meter squared um, gross floor area. 5.6 tons in the baseline and then when I introduced the 100 kilowatt PV system it drops down to 4.5 so a 25 uh, nearly 25 percent reduction um, associated with the PV so pretty significant change and you can do the same process by uh, yeah changing again the grid back to um, UK and then I have another model here for same PV I should have um, adjusted the generation capacity for the UK because it's less um, solar radiation but I kept this very simple um, just just to, to show this example so you notice the previous example it was a 1.3 tons savings per meter square whereas in the UK you only get uh, 300 kilograms 347 kilogram savings per meter square so a lot lower uh, reduction obviously because you're not on a lower carbon grid but what's interesting to look at is the, the template of the PV itself. So you go into, so there's a whole list of templates here that we use to put the model together. And the, the PV is in the back of the, at the end of the list here. Um, so we can see 
there's a bit of um, so there's initial impacts with the, the installation there's the recurring impacts every 25 years changing the panels the inverter and but you have the benefit of producing clean electricity so you end up with a gen overall saving in your PV system if we go even further and we change this to a, a decarbonized grid so this is a very low carbon grid projection by the UK government and this is not this is some indicators here not uh, meeting the standards that's why it's throwing this um, alarm or this yeah this alarm here for us And then I go and open the same model, but this one, same um, PV, 100 kilowatt system. And in this case, it actually provided an increase in impact, which means that the, the carbon, the, the, the grid is, is so low, the, the carbon intensity of the grid is so low that it's better for you to connect the grid instead of generating your own electricity on site because of the, the embodied impacts of the panels. Uh, obviously, this is a, a future projection and it's very optimistic. Uh, we hope we get there, but it's interesting to see that in the in the overall scheme of things, you know, so you can run sensitivity analysis on on these kind of things, uh, forecasting your your emissions and try to understand what happens uh, if you really hit that um, the government targets on reducing the carbon intensity of the grid. So um, we account for the, the so this is on a, an overall accounting for the impacts of the PV and the carbon savings for the for the PV system. So just very basic but giving us an example of how this um, helps us to understand what strategy makes most sense in which scenario and how we produce sensitivity studies to make sure this um, stack up you know throughout time as well um, Go back to the presentation here we're nearly finished um, so just to wrap up some misconceptions that as the LCA use increase uh, we we see happening um, associating LCA to materials thinking that uh, optimize each life cycle phase means that you're going to get uh, the lowest carbon design Prescriptive guidelines over life cycle phases or equals to good design. And that's a great methodology, but too complex. Whereas what we have um, seen with our own practice and as well as, as uh, our software users is um, should be looking at not only materials or not only energy or not only water, we should be looking at the whole building, whole of life one model aggregating everything sometimes optimizing life cycle impacts means trade-offs between phases so you in increase your embodied impact but you end up having a much larger operational savings for example the same with the, the building fabric or the pv example the life cycle design is, is far more adaptable and cost effective than any prescriptive as you can just see how everything interacts specifically for the application of your project and it's very hard to do that with prescriptive um, guidance and it's a great methodology and it's becoming much easier due to both being software advances as well as standard data quality availability of um, EPD, and I think the general understanding of the, the methodology in the industry. Um, 
So our recommendation is when you're setting targets for your project, uh, you consider the whole of project, whole of life. You define clear benchmarks. So you define your reference case for different typologies and locations. So it's not only important to achieve a percentage reduction, you need to understand your minimum requirements. You need to set clear benchmarks and raise the bar of those benchmarks throughout time as we improve construction codes, as we improve regulations, as we improve energy efficiency and the technology applied to design, we are always increasing the performance of these benchmarks. So we're always keeping, we keep pushing the performance of the, the, the final projects. Referencing standards, uh, both uh, well, the LCA standards in both product and building level standards, it's always important to have that compliance to make sure the studies are robust, comparable, data quality or the the required um uh, for yeah the, the the quality of the study we always recommend expanding the scope as much as possible you know excluding services is is very risky there's a lot of impacts associated with the the recurring the maintenance the refrigerant gases as we know and also the indirect energy use that are very often not captured in most models or rating schemes. So we always recommend to expand the scope as much as possible. So you know you're capturing the majority of the impacts of your projects. We also recommend to conduct independent review and use compliant LCA tools and, and reporting. So we, we can share that, we can communicate that properly and avoid confusion in the in the construction sector. Uh, back from uh, Wooden Grieve Engineers, uh, now Stuntech, gave us this quote quite a while ago when I was able to find in, in all the presentations I thought was relevant to this as well. It's like, it's like smartphones, once you, you try a life cycle assessment, you have, will have you asking how you managed before. So she got used to doing the, the integrated analysis and and yeah, it's a big fan of the the whole methodology and the software as well. Another great example that we we have been working with is uh, Metronet, and it, this is a, this is an infrastructure project. So Metronet is responsible for planning extensions to Perth uh, transport network, including rails, uh, stations, and very large infrastructure projects. Um, and Caroline said it enabled them to identify and compare different options to support the decision making process and achieve their sustainability targets. So this one is quite, quite interesting because it's, it's a different profile from a, a typical building that we used to. 40% of the imported emissions were associated with materials used um, upfront, so materials manufacturing, transport and construction, that's 40% of the total life cycle impacts. 23% uh, of emissions would come from recurring impacts, so maintenance, you know, replacing uh, maintenance of the rail, replacing ballast um, and other repairs and, and maintenance they were able to model, so very significant throughout time. And they're managing the, these assets. So it's very important for them to understand that long, longevity and the, the operational and the maintenance impacts. And, and the project will demonstrate a reduction in life cycle emissions by 3.6% through a 10% improvement in energy efficiency. So it's, it's, it's good information for them to understand where to focus and um where to yeah where to, to focus as part of the design process as well as where they're spending money another example is um, a recent project we worked with a, a new app that we released the the rapid lca app which is targeted at uh, low density housing developments so this project is down south in margaret river 
And what they've done is they've set that um, whole life carbon target, and it's both in, in operational and embodied with a negative. Um, so this is actually providing a benefit to the planet. So a negative 260 kilograms of carbon per bedroom per year. And then the design team is able to have the flexibility or whatever they want to do to hit that target, but it's very clear what the, the expectation is. Um, sorry, I went a bit over time.